Yoyo Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Pijana Bala Bha Giri Bara Dhari Gopijana Bala Bha Giri Bara Dhari Yasodhanandana Brajajana Ranjana Yasodhanandana Brajajana Ranjana Yamuna Tiravana Chari Yamuna Tiravana Chari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Gopi Janna Vallabha Giri Varadhari Gopi Janna Vallabha Giri Varadhari Yasodhanandana Brajajana Ranjana Yasodhanandana Brajajana Ranjana Yasodhanandana Brajajana Ranjana Yasodhanandana Brajajana Ranjana Yamuna Thiravana Chari Yamuna Yamuna Tiravana Chari Yamuna Tiravana Chari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari 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 Abba Kunja Bihari Thank you, Mahapati Prabhu. Jaya Om Vishnu Pad Paramahamsa Parivrakat Charya Ashtor Tarashri Shat Shri Shri Mad A.C. Bhakti Vedanta Swami Maharaj Prabhupada Ki Jai His Confounder Charya Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai Jai Om Vishnu Pad Paramahamsa Pravika Charya Ashtor Tarashat Shri Shri Mad Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Goswami Maharaj Prabhupada Ki Jai Nama Charya Srila Haridas Thakur Ki Jai Prem Se Kho Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Dvaita Gadadhar Shri Vasari Gaura Bhakta Vinda Ki Jai Shri Shri Radha Krishna Gopa Gopana Shamakun Radha Kun Giri Govardhan Ki Jai Shri Mari Pur Dham Ki Jai Shri Vindavan Dham Ki Jai Jagannath Puri Dham Ki Jai Ganga Mai Ki Jai Yamuna Mai Ki Jai Bhakti Devi Ki Jai Tulsi Devi Ki Jai Ananta Koti Vashna Vrinda Ki Jai Shri Harinam Sankirtan Ki Jai Grantaraj Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai Sama Veda Bhakta Vinda Ki Jai Gaura Premanende Rarbo All glories to the assembled devotees All glories to the assembled devotees All glories to the assembled devotees All glories to Shri Guru and Shri Gauranga All glories to Srila Prabhupada Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya 
ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय So we'll be reading from Shrimad Bhagavat Bhagavatam, uh, fifth canto, chapter eleven, text sixteen. If you could repeat after me, Na, Na. Yavad, Yavad. Itan, Itan, Mana, Mana. Atmalingam, Atmalingam. Samsara, Samsara. Tapavapanam, Janasya, Yach. Choka Moha Maya, Ragaloba, Vairanubandam, Mamatam, Vidate. Yeah, please. <coughs> Nayavaditan mana atma lingam. Nayavaditan mana atma lingam. Sang sadata pa vapanam janasya. Yachoka moha mayaraga loba. Yachoka moha mayaraga loba. Vairanu bandham mamatam vidhatte. Vairanu bandham mamatam vidhatte. Nayavaritan mana atma lingam. Nayavaritan mana atma lingam. Sangsarata pava panam janasya. Sangsarata pava panam janasya. Yet choke a moha mayaraga loba. Yet choke a moha mayaraga loba. Vairanu bandham mamatam vidhatte. Vairaganu bandham mamatam vidhatte. Nayavaritan mana atma lingam. Nayavaritan mana atma lingam. Sangsara tapa vapanam janasya. Sangsara tapa vapanam janasya. Yet choke a moha mayaraga loba. Yet choke a moha mayaraga loba. Vairanu bandham mamatam vidate. Vairanu bandham mamatam vidate. Avaditan manatma lingam Samsara tapa vapanam janasya Yachoka moha my ragaloba Vairab nubandam mamatam vidate Yavnavnaitan manatma lingam Samsarita pava panam janasya. Yachoka loha maragaloba. Nayavaditan man atma lingam. Samsarita pava panam janasya. Yachoka moha maya raga loba. Vairaga bandam mamatam vidate. Anyone from Zoom would like to chant? Okay. <coughs> Na, not. Yavat, as long as. Itat. This, manaha, mind, atmalingam, existing as the false designation of the soul. Samsartapa, of the miseries of this material world. Avapanam, the growing ground. Janasya, of the living being. Yet, which, shoka, of lamentation, moha, of illusion, amaya, of disease, raga, of attachment, loba, of greed, vaira, of enmity, 
Anubandam, the consequence. Mamatam, the sense of ownership. Vidati, gives. Translation and purport by His Divine Grace. A.C. Bhakti Vedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada. The soul's designation, the mind, is the cause of all tribulations in this material world. As long as this fact is unknown to the conditioned living entity, he has to accept the miserable condition of the material body and wander within this universe in different positions. Because the mind is affected by disease, lamentation, illusion, attachment, greed, and enmity, it creates bondage and a false sense of intimacy within this material world. The mind is the cause of both material bondage and liberation. The impure mind thinks, I am this body. The pure mind knows that he is not the material body. Therefore, the mind is considered to be the root of all material designations. Until the living entity is aloof from the association and contaminations of this material world, the mind will be absorbed in such material things as birth, death, disease, illusion, attachment, greed, enmity, and enmity. In this way, the living entity is conditioned, and he suffers material miseries. Oma jnana timarandasya jnana jana shalakaya chakshurun militam yena tasmai shri gurve namaha vanchakalpatarubhyasya kripa sindhubhye vacha patitanam pavine bhyo vaishna bhyo namo namaha jai shri krishna chaitanya prabhu nityananda shri dvaita gadadhara shri vasari gaur bhakta vrinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So I'll read the translation again. The soul's designation, the mind, is the cause of all tribulations in, this, in the material world. As long as this fact is unknown to the conditioned living entity, he has to accept the miserable condition of the material body and wander within this universe in different positions. Because the mind is affected by disease, lamentation, illusion, attachment, greed, and enmity. It creates bondage and a false sense of intimacy within this material world. So the mind is something that can turn hell into heaven or heaven into hell. If something is happening not the way that we want it to happen and we accept it, it is known as tolerance. But if I don't accept it, it becomes anger. If we face the uncertainty without acceptance, it becomes fear. And when we face the same uncertainty with acceptance, it is called adventure. When we don't accept the achievements that people have, it is called jealousy. But when we accept their achievements, it is called inspiration. If someone has hurt us and we are not able to accept it, it is called hatred. But the moment we accept it, it is called forgiveness. <clears throat> anything that is dealt with in acceptance is a positive emotion. And anything dealt with in a non-accepting way is a negative emotion. The mind is such a troublemaker. It gives us worries, it plans, it has regrets, it has expectations, it compares, and it's never satisfied. And it makes us doubt our decisions. That's the nature of the mind. And worrying gives a small thing a big shadow. For instance, taking an exam in school. The student studies for the exam and worries and worries about the result. Did I pass? Did I fail? Will I be able to get that nice job? Will I be able to get into that college? What will happen to me in the future? It is said that in childhood, one is attached to plane, and one, one is attached when one is in youth, one is attached to romance. And one is an adult, he is attached to making money. And in, in his later life, as an old man, he becomes attached to worrying. He, worrying. he worries about finances, family responsibilities, who's going to take over, loneliness, and wishing that he can rewind time. See, children, they keep looking at the time. When is, when is time going to go by? Time seems to go by slow. But for someone in old age, time goes by very fast. And when the mind is absorbed in too much worrying, it leads to anxiety. Then anxiety leads to a crippling state, such as depression. And then it may end in suicidal thoughts or contemplation. 
when I was working at the retirement home before I moved into the temple, the residents would always remember the past. How they met their husband, their wife, how their kids are doing, what type of work they used to do. And they do not mention religion or any spiritual practice. Why? Because they have not cultivated that in their earlier years. So a spiritual life should begin at an early age. Imagine the mind full of worries, full of anxiety, full of doubts, and the solution that I can only think of is ending everything. They take their own life. Therefore, we have a big problem with suicide in the youth. They cannot find any other means to solve the problems. They do not have anyone they can depend on to hear their struggles, no one to give them emotional support, no shoulder to lean on, so it's very tragic. And this is why so many people have turned to smoking, drinking, finding ways to alter their state of mind. They are running away from their problems. And nowadays, most people, they have friends over the computer. Some even have relationships, long distance relationships through the internet. And some even have marriages over the internet. And they do not meet their so-called lover face to face. They cut out their picture <laughs> and then paste it. <clears throat> so it's a very unfortunate and, and strange situation. And everybody's mind is thinking, what if? What if I married this woman? What if I married this man? What if I had gotten this job? What if I got this car instead of this? What if I went to school and not this one? What if? And we look at others' opinion and to decide whether we are successful in life or not. Social media is based off of this principle. If I get many likes, then I'm considered successful. If people don't like me, then I must be a failure. The whole social media is based on likes and dislikes. How many followers do I have and how many comments do I have? The new generation must get the public's approval as a way to see how well they are doing in life. To become successful, we need a lot of patience and we need to be able to handle failures. If a person is too absorbed in worrying about the future, he will miss out on the opportunities in the present. And we cannot change the past and we do not know what the future will hold. Only Krishna knows. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, I know everything that has happened in the past, all that is happening in the present, and all things that are yet to come. I also know all living entities, but me, no one knows. And before I was introduced to Krishna consciousness, I knew that the mind had to be controlled. If the mind was not controlled, it can lead one to a very dangerous situation. And so I like the idea of meditation. I like the idea of sitting down and trying to control the mind, focus the mind. So I didn't like to read. So one day I, I decided, you know, I'm going to go to a library, a uh, local library. And I was looking for books on meditation. And I found a small book and I began to re uh, read it. Towards the end of the book, it said, a good way to control anxiety, anxiousness, depression, agitation, is to recite prayers to calm the mind. So at the back of the book, it listed different prayers from the Bible and prayers from other sources, and they were quite lengthy. So I was thinking, how, how am I going to memorize these prayers? And I kept turning the page, and the very last page, the very last prayer that was listed was a Hare Krishna Mahamatra. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. And I was thinking, I can remember this. These are just three words, but little did I know it was Krishna's holy names. And I decided to try this uh, prayer during uh, traffic. I had very bad road rage. I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't stand being in traffic. I wanted to keep moving. I didn't like to be stagnant. And I began chanting it. And the next thing I knew, I was home. So this mantra completely made me forget that I was driving. And so I kept chanting and chanting it. And I noticed a difference within me. I 
became more tolerant and um so once upon a time there was a traveler and he decided to leave his village so he headed out and he found another village and outside the village was an old man outside the entrance so he asked the old man how are the people in this village so the old man asked him back how are the people from the village you came from so the traveler said they're all miserable they're selfish they're low they don't have any good qualities so the old man replied the same in this village so the traveler entered the village very angrily and a few moments later another traveler comes by and he sees the same old man and he asked the old man how are the people in this village so the same man old man he asked the traveler how are the people from your village and this man said they're all very kind we have deep friendships with each other where they're, they're trustworthy so the old man replied the same in this village so how can that be in in other words there's a a thing called a lens principle who we are determines how we see each other someone who is fashion minded will see the outfits of others before they see the face and someone who is into hairstyles, they will see the hair on the head before the person's facial features. And someone who is materially or worldly minded will judge others depending on the type of car they drive, the cost of someone's accessories, or how many employees they have. In other words, how we see ourselves is how we see the world. An example is given. If you squeeze a mango, only mango juice will come out orange juice will not uh, come out so if life squeezes us what will come out <laughs> will a person with concerns for the sufferings or misfortune of others come out or will a person who is only concerned with his own well-being come out and we may be able to fool others but we cannot fool ourselves or krishna krishna is seated in the heart a and someone who is self-realized, someone is actually in knowledge, they know that Jivera Swarup Hoy Krishnera Nichadas. The living entity's constitutional position is to be an eternal, eternal servant of Krishna. And the whole world is revolving around this skin disease. But a devotee, he doesn't see the difference in the outer dress. Whether one is American, Asian, Hispanic, Indian, no. He knows that the soul has been disconnected from Krishna. And the soul has been wandering around this material world and is now lost. So let me try to help him or her. And the most scariest thing for a child is being lost and not knowing where his parents are. When I was little, uh, my parents, they were, they were both working. So my grandmother, she took care of us. And I remember going to this elementary school, and I decided to let go of my grandmother's hand. I ran, and I was, you know, exploring. And when I looked back, I, I didn't f see my grandmother. I panicked. Uh, I became fearful, you know. And as a child, the only thing you can do is cry. So that's the position of these living entities. They're looking for happiness here, but that's not where happiness lies. And our duty is to reconnect them to Krishna. And my spiritual master, His Holiness Badri Narayan Maharaj, he asked this question during a talk. He said, what makes a family? Is it the color of your skin? Is it the, f the, the nation or country you were born? No. What makes a family is a common parent. And Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, that I am the seed-giving father to all living entities. And Srila Prabhupada, he describes two types of kata, Gram, Gramya kata and Krishna kata. And any literature that do not glorify Krishna, the all-attractive Supreme Personality of Godhead, is Gramya kata, useless. Because there is no benefit from hearing or reading such things. And Srila Prabhupada mentions, just like reading the newspaper, there's so, there's so many nonsense in the newspaper. 
and how many trees have been cut down just to print articles that does not help one in advancing in devotional service. And there are weapons of mass destruction, and there are also weapons of mass distraction. Television, commercials, advertisement, phones, gadgets, electronics, video games, conspiracy theories, etc. These distract these uh, distract us from the actual goal of life, which is to reestablish our lost loving relationship with Krishna. And Srila Prabhupada describes there are two types of birds, the crows and the swans. The crows, where do they like to hang out? In the garbage. Leftover food, they, they take pleasure in that. But the swans, they require clear water, lotus flowers, a nice garden. So similarly, there are two classes of men who are crow-like and swan-like. So people fall into these two categories. They, were, they will either find amusement in material topics, and then there are the devotees who cannot stand to hear such nonsense or prajalpa. If it does not relate to Krishna, we do not want to hear about it. And there's a saying, a man is known by the company he keeps. So who do we surround ourselves with? Do we surround ourselves with people who are only attracted to material success? Or are the friends we have searching for higher truths? Are they happy? Are they spiritually inclined to hear? Are the friends we have only interested in selfish motives? Do they have good intentions? Are they stuck in a place that's a dead end? Where is their life going? So we have the choice of who we associate with. We can associate with materialistic people or we can associate with devotees. And the choice is ours. And Dr. Martin Luther King, he said, we live in an age of guided missiles and misguided men. Yes, we may have made some advancement, but our so-called modern advancement has taken us where? Bigger bombs, more nuclear weapons, deadlier and massive ways to cause destruction. With more power, the hearts of men become less and less kinder. And the society that we live in, it promotes violence, competition, and barbarian-like behavior. Hmm? No. <laughs> And an example is sports, you know, they involve physical contact, boxing, kickboxing, MMA, football, hockey, and so on. People take pleasure seeing others get hurt or injured, and they shamelessly show this externally. Um, Ramapati Prabhu and I, we, we went on a Japa walk, and during the football season, we would hear intoxicated people cheer for their favorite team or fighter. And I was guilty of this myself before I was a devotee. I, I liked um, kickboxing. And whenever <laughs> someone would get knocked out, I would cheer, yay. But now it's, I, feel, uh, I feel very bad for the person that got their teeth knocked out. <laughs> Even in the video games that are out right now, they are mostly shooting games or games that desensitize saintly qualities within a human being. And Srila Prabhupada says, the human life begins when he accepts religion. That is the beginning of human life, and that is the difference between human life and animal life. Animal life is characterized by four basic needs, eating, sleeping, mating, and defending. And today's generation is a selfish generation. And the most selfish one-letter word is I. Ip iPod, iPad, iPhone. And the most uh, well-known is, I am this body. And anything in relation to this is mine. My family, my nation, my country, my rights, etc. And selfishness destroys the human ability to think and understand. Uh, a selfish rich man will only care about feeding his immediate or extended family. But that poor, hungry, homeless man around the corner will never cross his mind. He could care less, and although he has so much wealth, feeding the poor will not be his top priority. It destroys compassion and mercy towards others. This wealthy person forgets that his riches are due to the Supreme Lord's mercy and his past previous karma. 
When the mind is disturbed, agitated, judgment and proper discrimination is impaired. Just like when someone becomes angry, he doesn't think straight. He will not think of the consequences of his actions. And anger blinds our ability to take the right actions. For example, in relationships. Once a hurtful statement is said, it can never be forgotten. And the person may forgive the person, but it can be forgotten. The relationship will never be the same. And the same goes with our dealings with devotees. So we should be very careful with what we say and what we do. They say, when the liquor is in you, the truth comes out. Similarly, when anger enters our emotions, we may say things that are not nice and we lose all good sense. Therefore, Krishna says there are three gates leading to hell. Lust, anger, and greed. So one should uh, learn to tolerate. In the Srimad Bhagavatam, it says that one should never indulge in excessive affection or concern for anyone or anything. Otherwise, one will have to experience great suffering. An example is someone who is too attached to family life. His family is the source of his happiness, but when that very source is taken away, what happens? He becomes morose, he becomes lifeless. My wife is gone, my children are dead, why should I possibly want to live? My heart is so pained by separ separation from my family that life itself becomes simply suffering. And this can lead to either depression, suicide, or one might search for explanations, answers. Why is this happening? And there's a saying, the happiness of wealth is enjoyable by a person who has tasted the distress of poverty. And the experiences that we have cannot be the same of another who has not gone through that. For example, this body was born in the Philippines, and the Philippines is a third world country. So I know what poverty looks like. I know what real ghettos look like, and I know what dirt poor looks like. But at the same time, I also know what it means to have wealth. You appreciate it. And a person who grew up in a nice suburban neighborhood with running water, who has a closet full of clothes with toys all over the floor, will never know what it feels like to live in a poverty-stricken country. And that's just a fact. In, in my little village, we use a well for everything, the water. We use it for bathing, we use it for cooking, we use it to clean. And <laughs> now here, you just turn on a, a, a faucet, you know, and then water comes out. So people from all over the world come to America for a better living condition, but the ones who are born here, they would rather be hippies and live on the streets. And so waste and misuse of human form of life. And when I go on book distribution, I tell people to read the back of uh, The Journey of Self-Discovery. And it says the first line, at some point, a fortunate soul wanders, wonders, who am I? Why do I have to suffer? And what is the meaning of my life? So I ask people, can you find a very significant word in that first sentence? And then they will say, you know, they don't, <laughs> they'll guess, but I tell them, no, the word is fortunate. How many people will go out and searching for these types of questions? So a soul who is searching out is considered fortunate. And Krishna confirms this in the Bhagavad Gita. He says, out of many thousands among men, one may endeavor for perfection. And of those who have achieved perfection, hardly one knows mean truth. After many births and deaths, he who is actually knowledge surrenders unto me, knowing me to be the cause of all causes and all that is. Such a great soul is very rare. So those devotees who have dedicated or served in this movement are not ordinary people. They are great souls. We should keep that in mind. And our hearts should be full of kindness, forgiveness, and peace. I was telling Dimitri yesterday that when I was working at the retirement home, 
I saw a lot of deaths and I saw a lot of people that were lonely. And I remember this uh, lady, her name was Liz. And during the end of her life, she, she would call me. She would call people, the caregivers. She would ask, is Glenn working? I would like to speak to him. So I would go to her room and I would ask her, you know, how can I help you, Liz? And so she asked a very nice question. She said, what happens at the time of death? So she was laying there and yeah, she, she was given maybe a, a, a month or so to live. So I started discussing that in the Bhagavad Gita it says whatever state of being one is in at the time of death that will determine his next, his next life. And she appreciated this. She was asking a lot of nice questions and you can tell she was searching out for answers because you know, a sane person when when they, when they know they have a little time left, they should inquire. And so this uh, lady, she would call, call me again and again into her room. And I would tell her, Liz, I, I would love to speak to you, but I also have uh, other duties. I have to give medications and this and that. And the question that she asked, it helped me to uh, preach to her Krishna consciousness. And I told her about the mantra. I said, you can simply chant this mantra. And so I asked her to repeat it with me. And after a, a few, you can say days, she left her body. And there was another incident where this uh, man, he was a Jehovah's Witness. And he would, every time I would give him his medications, we would talk about religion, we would talk about God, we would talk about life. And he said, I know the black and whites, but you know the grays. So, and I gave him a small book, the introduction to the Bhagavad Gita. And he asked me, what days are you working? I, I would like to speak to you. And so I told him, I'm working this, this, and this days. And when he left the retirement home, his family had informed me that he passed away. And in this in this uh, family, I I had you know got to know them, and the family would ask me, "How do you deal with a workplace like this? You know, you see people dying all the time. You see people suffering. How do you? How are you so calm?" So I told them, "It depends." I would tell them I would speak philosophically with them. I would tell them that the soul is eternal, and this family. When his when her father was uh, in in a weak stage, <coughs> she came up to me and she was asking me questions. So I was at that time I was trying my best to answer them. And the day that he left his body, the daughter she sent a check to the facility, and the check con it was five hundred dollars. So she appreciated um, the nice information that I gave her. And so that means that everybody's looking for answers. Everybody is looking for someone that can answer their questions, you know. And when I go on book distribution, I hear this a lot. They say, no, I don't have time to read. So <laughs> I tell them, when will you have time then, you know. And I tell them that tomorrow is not guaranteed. So the best uh, time is to start reading now. Some of them take books and some don't. So that <laughs> means that People are too busy to be happy. We're offering them an opportunity, an alternative to live life, not in a materialistic way, but a spiritual way. And I was uh, distributing books um, a few days ago at La Jolla Cove, and this person asked me, why do you do this? So I told them that these books, they free you from fear, to be fearless. And then so he, he was in a, you know, he looked like a martial artist. So you can tell he was kind of puffed up. So then I asked him, what happens at the time of death? And his face changed. And I told him, you know, can you give me an answer? And he said, no. So I said, you should take this little book uh, coming back. And I told him it was about reincarnation, karma, what type of body or situation uh, we will get next in the, in the next life. And he, he liked it, he gave a donation, and 
he took the book and he was sharing it with his family. So even these big uh, puffed up people, they need they need answers also. They need the devotees to go out and give them uh, Srila Prabhupada's books. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Any comments, questions, corrections? Uh, how, how hold, on, hold, hold on, Vijay. One okay. second. Yes, I can wait. I have a question. It's yes. an unusual question. You started reading there, or, or you started uh, giving at the beginning. This leads to that, this leads to that, this turns into that. It was, is that something you, you were reading there, or you had written yourself, or what? I, I, I was listening to a lecture, and then I got the idea from this devotee. So it was originally some devotee. Yeah. All right, I'll talk to you later about that. Okay. Go ahead, Vijay Krishna Prabhu. Yes, uh, thank you very much. You're very kind, uh, Govardhan Prabhu. Uh, and thank you for your, if I may say, exceptional uh, class. Prabhu, the quote from, from the purpose related to the verse you chose for today, 511, um, 16, is as follows. Quote, until the living entity is aloof from the association and contaminations of this material world, the mind will be absorbed in such material things as birth, death, disease, illusion, attachment, greed, and enmity. In this way, the living entity is conditioned, and he suffers material miseries." End quote. So Prabhu, based on this quote, my question is as follows. How is it possible for the living entity to be aloof from the association and contaminations of this material world while living in a completely uh, uh, polluted and contaminated world. Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll try to answer that. So, when the living entity is associating with the body that he has, he becomes absorbed in things like failure, success, uh, disease, things like that. Uh, but if he's situated in the, in the spiritual platform, he knows that all these are not, uh, they don't, the soul is different or aloof from all these contaminations. And the material miseries, there are three. Uh, miseries caused by the mind and body, uh, miseries caused by other living entities, and then miseries caused by material nature. And also a devotee should know that everything that is happening to him is happening accordingly to his karma. And if something undesirable happens, we should see that this is a small token of Krishna's uh, mercy. And if something is very good that's happening, we should see it as another uh, mercy of Krishna that we're able to perform a better service. Okay. Do you have anything to add, yeah. Ravita Prabhu? Yeah. Uh, the question brings... And it's a good question, because how can you stay aloof? You're in the middle of this uh, craziness. You know, it seems impossible. But the first verse is the one I quote often from the 13th chapter of Bhagavad Gita. Purushak Pakati Stohi Bhunkte Pakati Chan Kananangura Sangha Sya Sadasadyoni Janmasu. So there Krishna says that the, the living entity, who's by nature prakriti, but acting as an enjoyer, is called a purusha. So he's, he's in prakriti, purusha prakriti stohi. And he's experiencing the modes of nature that are generated out of prakriti. Bhunkte um, prakriti um, jan gunan. Now, then it says, karanan guna sangha said that as, as that living entity, which is all us, we associate with that modes, that determines our next birth. That, so, th so, th so in human life, there's a there's a a, a, a measure of uh, uh, decision making. In other words, discrimination. And if we have the right information, we can associate in a certain way that we will we will remain aloof. And the other verse that comes to mind is the first verse of this Sadhu Sangashtika by Kapila Dev, three twenty five twenty, where he starts off with this word prasangam. Now, sangam we know means two things. It means association and also attachment. Because association leads to attachment. 
right? So at the present moment, our prasanga, our, our main attachments and association, are with the things of this world. We're completely absorbed in likes and dislikes of, of this world. That has to be turned toward the sadhus. It doesn't say immediately toward Krishna, but you have to first get in touch with the sadhus, the devotees. And uh, then the purification starts. And then a few verses later, he uses the same word. And this is the answer to the question. Satam prasangan mamavirya sambhido bhavanti ridkana rasayana kata. So when, when you, you, you are able to... And the prasanga means uh, strong attachment or strong association. You're not just sitting... In, 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 you're sitting here and like someone may come to uh, check out the Hare Krishnas. So the class is going on, they're sitting in the corner... But their minds are wandering, they're checking this out, what is all this about? They're not really hearing much anyway. It's, it's good, but it's not as good as actually one who's listening closely and taking it in. That's prasanga. Yeah. So in the association of devotees, that, 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 that uh, powerful association, uh, you're going to hear transcendental knowledge from the right source. And he says it's just like rasayana kata. This kata is just like life-giving uh, substance. And it results in increasing shraddha, uh, and rati, attraction to Krishna, and, and bhakti. Shraddha, uh, rati, bhakti, onukrimashiti. And it also, in, in later in it says, it also increases vairagya. And that vairagya is where this comes in. This is how you can be aloof. Prabhupada was totally aloof. He came to the, to, the, to the heart of the material world, New York City. He's wandering up Broadway. I used to live in, in New York. And Broadway is filled with all kinds of, you know, all kinds of dirty things and everything. And Prabhupada was completely pure. He's just trying to find a bookstore to sell his books. So you can remain aloof even in the middle, middle of the contaminations by uh, developing your strong Krishna consciousness in this way. Uh, yes, Adravida Prabhu, as usual, outstanding answer uh, to my question. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, uh, Gobardhan Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, thank you. Yes. So I have a question, Prabhu. So in Bhagavad Gita, like uh, in a basic understanding, like we are constantly told that you know, mind, uncontrolled mind is an enemy, and we have to constantly engage it in Lord service, uh, so that uh, that's one way to control it, especially in uh, Krishna consciousness. So uh, my question is, uh, is mind a material thing? Like, uh, is it only present in the material world, or in spiritual world, will the mind be destroyed like body or? Do we have some, uh, like, like what is the difference in, uh, or so do we have mind or not in the spiritual world? So as far as I know, um, there are two bodies, a gross physical body and a subtle body. The physical body is what we see in the mirror, and then a subtle body consists of the mind, intelligence, and false ego. So the mind is still considered uh, material, but in the spiritual world, um, I'm not too sure. Okay. Yeah. It becomes a, a spiritual mind. Yeah. The mind, the mind is is being uh, used by the soul, but the, but but when the, when you're in the material world, the soul is is helpless. You don't ha you've lost your remembrance of Krishna, so you're being controlled by the lower self, which includes the mind, and and the mind is being controlled by the senses. Intelligence being controlled. In other words, the, the lower self is controlling the higher self. But when we get, we draw some strength from the super soul, this is in the third chapter, you know, and which is Krishna himself. In other words, through the instructions, which we can't hear directly, but hear outside from the, from the guru, sadhus, and the shastra, then uh, the, the, the soul can control the mind. That's the whole idea. Don't be, don't be controlled by the mind. There's that, if you allow me, this, this the verse I quote all the time. Um, what is it? Kama dinam katina katita palita do nideshas, desham jata maina kadunana to pano pishanti. Utsri jayatan nadiyatopate sam pratam nam to buddhis, twama yatak shadanamama yamam the young svatmatase. So he says, for so many, in so many ways, I, I have sought to obey the seductive demands of my wicked desires. Now they're coming from my contaminated mind. Uh, they've shown me no mercy, Vastanga agreed. Uh, they've shown me no mercy, but on I've, on I've gone trying to, uh, to, uh, to satisfy lust on 
on first of all the, the demands. <laughs> but now I'm rejecting these hellish desires, for my higher intelligence now has awoken. O Krishna, O shelter of fearlessness, please let me serve you with faith that will never be broken. So we have to serve. Now this devotee, this actually Madhavendra Puri, I think wrote this verse, it's hard to say. But it's quoted by Lord Chaitanya in the CC. Uh, is that, 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 that we've been living uh, under the demands of our lower self, the contaminated mind, the senses, and so forth. But by the, the, the instration of the intelligence, I've gained my intelligence, now I'm realizing I have to direct that, the, that, that service attitude, not toward these demands, but toward Krishna. So he said, please engage me. So yes, the mind is material, just like the, the hands are material, the, the senses are material. But they can, they can be our, our masters and they can drag us down into, into hell. Because uh, if, they're, if we don't uh, control them, we, let them, we get controlled by them. Any, anyone else? Okay. All right. Time for burritos and quesadillas. <laughs> Thank you for your time. Grant Raj Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai. <laughs>